Ketzel actually attended a concert in which our composition was played. And when it was announced, this is by Ketzel Kotel, Ketzel meowed loudly at the sound <laughs> of her name. See, this, this is the wonderful details that you find out when you research. This is the Book of Life. I'm Heidi Rabinowitz. Leslie Ann Newman has written 70-plus books. She won the Sidney Taylor Book Award for her picture book, Ketzel, the Cat Who Composed, and she was at the 2016 Conference of the Association of Jewish Libraries in Charleston, South Carolina, to accept her award. I sat down with her there to talk about Ketzel and her other writings. Visit lesliakids.com to learn more about her. During the podcast, you'll hear Ketzel's composition, performed by Guy Livingston on his CD, Don't Panic. Thanks to Guy for permission to use it, and be sure to check out his music podcast, American Highways, at guylivingston.com slash radio. So I'm here with Leslie and Newman who has written many, many books, but in particular, I'm interested to hear about the recent Sidney Taylor Book Award winning title, Ketzel, The Cat Who Composed. The, the title kind of gives away what it's about to some extent, um, but go ahead and give a brief overview. So it's based on a true story. Uh, Ketzel was owned by a composer named Moshe Kotel, or maybe Moshe Kotel was owned by Ketzel. (laughs) And he was a composer, and um, one day Ketzel ran down his keyboard for no apparent reason, and he wrote down what he heard and sent it to a contest. And Ketzel's composition won an honorable mention. And Ketzel became world famous, and Ketzel's composition was played all over the world. That is so cool. So now, is your story fiction based on a true story, or is it actually a non-fiction picture book? Well, that's a very interesting question, because I have seen it categorized as both. I think of it as fiction, like historical fiction, because it's based on a true story, but um, some people have um, considered it a not... In fact, I think it won a prize for some non-fiction award. Or, it's definitely been on lists, non-fiction lists. Mm-hmm. So... It won the Sidney Taylor, which is for Jewish literature, and the name of the composer is obviously Jewish. But is there anything else about it that you think makes it particularly Jewish? Well, the word Ketzel means cat in Yiddish, so Mm -hmm. there's that. But there's also the whole notion of Kavanah, which means attention and intention. The way I found out about the story actually is from a column that my rabbi wrote in our synagogue's newsletter, where he mentioned this whole event and talked about uh, Mr. Kotel's Kavanaugh and that he was open to the surprising moments of beauty in everyday life and paid attention to them. And so to me, that concept is all through this book, and it's a very Jewish concept. Plus, creativity is a very Jewish concept, right? We were created in the image of our creator. And I feel for myself, every time I create, uh, like write a picture book such as this, I'm doing something holy and spiritual. Oh, that's beautiful. So since this is based on a true story, was there much research involved? It's it's not a very in-depth story, sort of an anecdote almost. What did you have to do to find out the details? Well, even though the book is a little shy of 2,000 words, there were hours and hours and hours of research. Uh, I, first of all, I love doing research, and second of all, I really wanted to pay homage to Mr. Kochel, who is no longer living. And the way my rabbi heard about it was because he had seen Kessel's obituary in the New York Times. Aww. Okay, so first of all, I'm a cat lover. Um, my cat, Princess Sheba Darling, just died a few weeks ago. Aww. And by the way, she sat on my lap the whole time I wrote the book. <laughs> um, so I was immediately intrigued, so I went right from my synagogue's newsletter to 
to the computer and I read the obituary in the New York Times, which mentioned that Quetzal has a chapter in a book about about, uh, women composers in classical music. So I went out and got that book. And then I um, read a few articles from the Johns Hopkins Gazette because Mr. Cotel was a faculty member. Actually, I believe the chair of the Department of Classical Music um, at Johns Hopkins. And then there were, I don't think, I can't find it anymore, but there was a very hour-long interview with Mr. Cotel that had aired on NPR that was online. And so I just did a lot of research because I just wanted to get it right. And I also found a recording of Quetzal's composition, which I listened to over and over, which I found very inspiring. And I found out, and I love this, that the world debut of Quetzal's composition was played by a 10-year-old girl. (laughs) <laughs> so I tracked her down. She's no longer 10. Um, so, you know, there was just a, a lot more goes into a book like this than appears. If you're not a writer, then you probably don't know what it takes. And actually, writing something shorter is harder than writing something longer. And this mm. book was originally a chapter book. Oh. Yeah, it was about 5,000 words. And I sent it in to my brilliant editor, Katie Cunningham, at Candlewick. And she said, I love the story, but I really think it's a picture book. So I had to be like Freddy Krueger and slash, slash, slash. And that was very (laughs) painful. Uh, But ultimately, I think she was right. And had it been a chapter book, we would not have the gorgeous illustrations by Amy June Bates, which I think really brings both Quetzal and Mr. Cotel to life. Yeah, they are gorgeous. So did you say that there was an entire chapter in a a book about composers on Quetzal? Yes. So it's a short chapter. Okay, I was going to ask you, what what is there to tell? I mean, I assume this is the only thing Quetzal ever composed. Uh, Well, there is the story, and then there is what happened to the composition, which, like I said, has been played all over the world, and actually Mr. Cotel incorporated it into a larger piece. Hmm. And um, now I'm giving away my whole book, but... (laughs) You'll, your listeners will still buy it, I'm sure. Yes, they will. Um, Quetzal actually attended a concert in which our composition was played. And when it was announced, this is by Quetzal Cotel. Quetzal meowed loudly at the sound <laughs> of her name. See, this, this is the wonderful details that you find out when you research that I had to put into my book because it's such a charming story. And Quetzal also got a royalty check uh, for $19.72. <laughs> And then Mr. Cotel, who clearly had a wonderful sense of humor, was very amused that his cat's fame surpassed his own and referred to her as his favorite student. And there's just a lot of charm to this whole thing. What other kinds of music did Mr. Cotel? Mr. Cotel composed an entire symphony, four-part symphony, uh, by the time he was ten. Wow. Yeah. Music was just deeply, deeply, deeply in his soul. And then when he was, I think, in his late 50s or early 60s, I can't remember, he decided to become a rabbi. And his thesis was a musical composition. And then he toured all over the world with this composition that talked about Judaism in a very profound way through music. Hmm. So he was a, a really interesting man. He died of a heart attack in his early 60s, which was a huge loss to all of us. But I hope that people who read Quetzal the Cat Who Composed will take an interest not only in Quetzal, but in Mr. Cotel and all his wonderful accomplishments. Excellent. You were telling me earlier that you have written 70 books, is that right? Well, I've actually written more than 70 books. There are many that are still waiting to find homes with publishers, but in terms of books that either exist or are under contract, the number is 70. Wow. I'm going for 99, and then I might call it a day. We'll see. <laughs> well, it sounds like you're going to make it at this rate, because that's... I hope so. That's you know, my productive. My grandmother died a couple of months shy of her 100th birthday, and she said, nobody needs to live to be 100. And I'm thinking, does anybody need to really write 100 books? I'm not sure. But maybe I'll find out. <laughs> you're so close. You might as well go for it. I might as well. <laughs> out of those books, many of them are Jewish and are books that are in my library. Do you want to talk about a few that are maybe personal favorites or or special to you in some way? Sure. A book that's really very, very close to my heart, uh, which came out last year, is called I Carry My Mother. And it is a book of poetry about a Jewish daughter's journey through her mother's illness and death and afterwards, or how she carries on without her. And by carry on, I mean that in every sense 
of the phrase. My mom died in 2012. She had bladder cancer and COPD. She was a lifelong smoker. And she also wanted to be a writer. Before she died, she called me to her hospital bed and she said, I'm giving you permission to write about all this. And by all this, she kind of swept her hand around the room under one condition, promise me I'll never have to read it. <laughs> and, you know, she knew she was dying. And I think she gave me this gift because she, well, first of all, she knew I would write about it anyway, but the, she gave me this permission and encouragement because she knew that writing would help me grieve her and mourn her and celebrate her and remember her. And so the, the book is a, it's a series of poems that are all related. They're all in accessible form, and they start with her diagnosis and they end with her first yard site. I see you have a copy of I Carry My Mother here with you. Would you like to read a poem from it? Yeah, I will read actually the next to last poem in the book, Yartzeit, which is a series of haiku. Yartzeit. Golden autumn leaves drift lazily through the air onto mother's grave. White winter snowflakes fall all over themselves to blanket mother's grave. Gentle spring raindrops are sent down from the heavens to wash mother's grave. Warm summer breezes chase pale yellow butterflies around mother's grave. Today marks a year. Endless tears soak one small stone placed on mother's grave. Beautiful. We had spoken by phone not that long ago about another poetry book, a picture book, Here's the World. I can't remember if we've done any interviews about any of your other Jewish books, but we were talking earlier about A Sweet Passover, which is another favorite of mine. So A Sweet Passover is about a little girl named Miriam who on the last day of Passover wakes up sick, sick, sick of matzah. She just can't stand the idea of eating any more matzah. She goes downstairs, her whole family is gathered, and her grandfather's making a matzah brai, and she wants none of it. The family tells her the story of Passover and why it's important for us to eat matzah, and by the end, she asks her grandfather, will you make me a matzah brai? And he actually says no. And she's very surprised, as is the reader, I'm sure. <laughs> and then he says, we will make one together. Mm-hmm. So it's, a, it's an intergenerational story, and the grandfather is based on my own father, who doesn't cook at all except once a year. On <laughs> Sunday morning of Pesach, he makes matzah brai, and it has his recipe in the back of the book. And he's very proud of that. That's awesome. And then you said you had a few Jewish books that are coming out soon. Do you, are you ready to talk about them? Sure. Um, Hanukkah Delight is a rhyming board book about Hanukkah being celebrated by a family of Jewish rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know they were going to be rabbits. That was the illustrator's idea. and It's really quite charming. Just adorable. And then Giddle's Journey, an Ellis Island story, is a picture book for slightly older readers coming out from Abrams, I think in 2018. Very hard to wait that long. And it is also based on the true story of my mother's best friend's mother, who came from the old country to Ellis Island by herself because the adult she was traveling with was turned away because of an eye infection. Hmm. So it's what happened to her on the boat and when she came to this country and had no way of finding her relatives. So you're one of the more productive writers I've ever met. Is there a trick to it? You just can't help yourself? Like, how do you keep up that energy? God, I wish there was a trick to it. My beloved friend and mentor, Jane Yolen's philosophy is B-I-C, as in big pen, as in butt in chair. <laughs> should be T-I-C, tuchus in chair. Maybe I'll start that. But basically, if you want to write, you have to write. You have to sit down every day and write. I write at least three pages every morning. Sometimes I call it fetching on paper. You know, I'm actually, I know people never believe this, but it's really true. I'm the kind of writer, I don't have a lot of ideas. Every time I finish something, I think, oh my God, that's it. I don't have an idea. What am I going to do? As opposed to somebody like Jane, who just has so many ideas, she doesn't think she'll get to them all in her lifetime. And other writers who have idea notebooks and idea index cards, I'm just a blank slate every time I finish a project. And I am as terrified as I was the first time I finished my first book and thought, that's it, I'm a one-book author. So the way the ideas generate is by moving the pen across the page, and I still write in a notebook with a big pen. (laughs) Um, And then when something gets going, I put it 
onto my computer and then I work with it. But there, there's no trick. Or if there's if somebody else knows a trick, I wish they would tell it to me. It's like anything, like if you play a sport, if you play a musical instrument like Mr. Kotel, the more you do it, the more you improve. In fact, I love this quote by Pablo Casals, the Puerto Rican cellist, who said when he was like, I don't know, in his 90s, he was practicing every day and somebody asked him why at this point in his life did he sit down with the cello every day. And he said... I think I might be improving. <laughs> I just love that. So I think I might be improving. I'm not sure. But the only thing I know for sure is that if I don't pick up my pen on any given day, nothing will happen on the page. That's all I know. I know if I do pick up my pen, something might happen, something might not happen. But if I don't pick up the pen, nothing will happen. That's the only fact. Right. Is there anything you'd like to talk about that I have not thought to ask you? I would love to talk about one other forthcoming book, though it doesn't have any Jewish content. Okay. It's called Sparkle Boy, and it's coming out next year from Lee and Lowe Books. It is about a little boy who likes sparkly things like his sister, and his sister is not pleased with this, but something happens that makes her change her mind, and I'm excited about it. All right, good. And that's a picture book? And it's a picture book. Okay. I seem to be writing picture books, poetry, and personal essays, which I've been publishing in various places like the Huffington Post... Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me. You're so welcome. Thank you. Books have dedication pages, and libraries have dedication plaques. The Book of Life podcast has dedications, too. Here's a dedication for our next episode. This is Joel Ben Izzy, author of Dreidels on the Brain. And I'll be joining you soon on the Book of Life podcast. And I'd like to dedicate my episode to all those people who are looking at the darkness and trying to find some light right now. If you enjoy the Book of Life podcast, please become a patron at patreon.com slash bookoflife. Leave a review on iTunes or a comment on our blog at bookoflifepodcast.com. You can also like our page at facebook.com slash bookoflifepodcast. Follow us at twitter.com slash bookoflifepod. Email us at bookoflifepodcast at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail. 561-206-2473. The Book of Life is a podcast service of the Feldman Library at Congregation B'nai Israel in Boca Raton, Florida at cbiboca.org and is supported in part by the Association of Jewish Libraries at jewishlibraries.org. Our background music is provided by the Freilach Makers Klezmer String Band. Thanks for listening and happy reading. Happy reading.